I call this Committee on Civil Law and Data Practices Policy to order. Today is Tuesday, February 22, 2022. Uh, enjoy 2 22 uh, for the one day we have it, members. Uh, we have two items uh, on the agenda. Um, before I do that, uh, oh yes, thank you. And we do have a quorum present. Let the record show a quorum present. Uh, before we get to the bills, I want to introduce a new staff member uh, in my office and joining us for the committee. Uh, Matthew Noonan is our newest uh, CLA committee legislative assistant for this committee. And uh, I want to welcome you on board and thank you for uh, your work here with this committee. Um, so uh, before us members today, we have two bills. And the first one up will be Senate File 2429 from Senator Limmer. Senator Limmer, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate File 2429 is before you. It originally created as a request from Hennepin County. Uh, let me uh, give you a little background. This bill will make private the data collected by government entities that are considered, quote unquote, education support services data. Uh, this data is being collected through facilitation of such services as Hennepin County to reduce disparities for the county's most vulnerable residents. Hennepin County requested and received a temporary data classification of private data on individuals for program participant information, but this, classifies, this classification only exists until August of this year and then it expires. This bill would make that information permanently uh, classified as private on individuals. And that's exactly what our Senate File 2429 does. The bill is only intended to make private data on individual participants and not the program itself. As background, the Education Support Services Program coordinates between schools, child protection, juvenile probation, both county attorneys and public defenders or other service providers as requested by the participant to help improve academic performance. Much of the data provided by other county departments or state agencies are considered private, but since the county is then creating additional data about what services a student may need, it's no longer, it would no longer be protected under current law. Individuals may be unwilling, we fear, if it doesn't have this data private cl uh, classification, they may be unwilling to participate in the program if it was public. Uh, today, I do have representatives from uh, the Education Support Service Program, uh, Ms. Krista Mims, and also Ms. Krista Lati Johnson, the county's responsible authority and data compliance official, to give us a little more detailed background. All right, thank you, Senator Limmer. Um, which of the two testifiers, was there a plan for one of you to speak before the other? Otherwise, uh, Ms. Lati Johnson's listed first on my agenda. I can go with that, but is there a preference on, by either of you? Um, actually, Krista Mims is going to go first. All right, sounds good. Uh, Ms. Mims, uh, welcome there. I'm trying to find which Zoom box you're in. I found you there. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then feel free to begin your testimony. Um, good afternoon. My name is Krista Mims. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, I am the Director of Education Support Services at Hennepin County. I greatly appreciate this time this afternoon to speak in support of this bill introduced by Senator Limmer. Hennepin County's Education Support Services began in August of 2020. The department is housed within the county's disparity reduction line of business outside of the welfare, justice, or other county systems to intentionally empower youth and their families to choose the support they receive from Education Support Services. The department strives to address the racial and educational disparities faced by youth who receive county services and address the academic achievement and opportunity gap of county connected youth. Educational support specialists provide support and resources with a focus on student empowerment, skill building and collaboration with families, schools and support professionals 
through educational navigation, advocacy, mentoring, and tutoring. The program strives to increase engagement, academic skills, and educational outcomes for county connected students in K-12 or GED seekers who are disproportionately youth of color. Our team receives data from referring program areas within the county and from sources outside the county, including schools, other support professionals and agencies, and our tutoring partner. We provide a Tennyson warning to our participants and will only exchange data, including the initial referral with the consent of the participant. We create data when assessing the strengths and needs of the student and family, developing support plans to promote ongoing academic goals and achievement, documenting reports of academic growth from our tutoring partner, and when receiving information from other partners supporting a family's educational needs. This bill will help to protect the data collected and created by education support services, allowing us to continue to provide transformative services for youth and their families. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. My colleague, Christy Lottie Johnson, will provide additional context and information in her testimony. Thank you, Ms. Mims. Appreciate you sharing with us. Uh, Ms. Lottie Johnson, welcome to the committee. Uh, state your name for the record and then feel free to begin. My name is Christy Lottie Johnson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I am the Responsible Authority and Data Practices Compliance Official for Hennepin County. I echo my colleague's appreciation to Senator Limmer for authoring the proposed legislation that we are here to discuss today. Ms. Mims has shared with you Hennepin County's approach to reducing disparities, especially in the area of education. She has also described the data collected and created by the Education Support Services Department. The Minnesota Government Data Practices Act allows for government entities to request a temporary classification of data in which similar data has been classified as not public or in which public access to the data would render unworkable a program authorized by law. The government, the government entity must also clearly establish that no statute currently exists which either allows or forbids the classification as not public. In September 2020, Hennepin County applied to the Minnesota Data Practices Office for a temporary classification for the participant data created by the Education Support Services Department. The result to have the participant data classified as private data on individuals was granted in November 2020. This, class, this temporary classification was communicated to the legislature by the Minnesota Data Practices Office in January 2021, as required by statute. We are now moving forward to have the data permanently classified as private data on an individual to address the August deadline for the expiration of the temporary classification. Senate File 2429, as introduced by Senator Limmer, adds a new section to the broad category of family, welfare, and benefit data. Proposed Section 13.463 defines education support services data and classifies the participant data as private data on an individual. Because participants and their families are referred from programs in which their data are classified as private data on an individual, we believe they would have the same expectation for their data held by the Education Support Services Department. If the data about program participants and their family members are not classified as private, it is likely that the youth, parents, or caregivers will choose to decline services, limiting the county's ability to provide supports to some of our most vulnerable residents. If the individual chooses to participate in the program and the data created by the program are not classified as private, if requested, Hennepin County would be compelled to release the data, which could adversely affect the data subject's well-being or reputation. Thank you for taking the time to consider this proposed legislation. My colleague, Krista Mims, and I are available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Lottie Johnson. I guess uh, you started answering um, Maybe I'd ask you, uh, one of you uh, two testifiers, or even Senate counsel, to maybe expand on that final point you were making about just what it would look like on a day-to-day -day operation if the temporary classification expires. Uh, and and um, that was what I wrote down as the question I wanted to ask to have fleshed out. Uh, just uh, maybe expand on that, or I might go to Senate counsel as well, but could you just give any more picture of day-to-day -day what that would look like. 
Um, I can start, and then if somebody else wants to um, add anything, that that would be great. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. So, from what I understand and from how it works, the data that we're currently collecting, including dates of birth of the um, individuals, if they have, um, if they have um, individual development plans at the school, anything like that, if it's collected by us and we have it in the Education Support Services Department file, um, when, the, when the temporary data classification ends, that data would then become public. And so anybody that asked for that data could have access to that data um, on the individual. So we've always anticipated and assumed that the data about the program itself, um, how the program was um, formed, how it's funded, everything like that is considered public. What we're looking for is only the um, classification for data on the participants. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, that helps put it in perspective. Um, Ms. Primo, do you have anything to uh, to add to that answer? Mr. Chair and members, um, generally there's a presumption in the Government Data Practices Act that all data held by a government entity is public data unless there's a specific classification that makes it private under state statute or there's um, a classification under federal law. Um, and because there is, um, because of the way the department is organized, although the data looks a little bit similar to maybe let's say welfare data, it still doesn't fall within those current categories. So yes, it's, it's um, if this temporary classification expires and there's no privacy classification under statute that the government entity is obligated to provide, um, to respond to a request for any publicly available data. All right, thank you, Ms. Primo. I will go to questions from the committee. I have Senator Bigham first, followed by Senator Westrom. So Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, First, uh, I want to thank Ms. Lonnie Johnson and Ms. Mims for being here today and testifying. This is really, uh, I'm a co-author on the bill. I, I sit with not only you, Mr. Chair, and Senator um, Carlson and um, Limmer on the Data Practices Commission, um, and we talk about these issues all the time. But this is very almost technical, but it, it's important um, to protect this information. Um, and so uh, I hope the committee supports this bill. I know I will uh, and just appreciate it being brought brought forward for a discussion today. Thank you, Senator Bigham. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, thank you. Uh, I guess one of the testifiers, I think, I think I'm uh, following the answer, or maybe Senator Limmer, I'll let's start with you and pitch to whichever testifier you want. But my understanding is this is not starting a program, uh, but it's merely continuing or facilitating for the data to be uh, clearly private. Uh, but this isn't expanding a program or starting a program. Uh, and, and if it is, then, then I have a little more concern. But I, I, my understanding is it's not. Is that correct? And Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Westrom. Uh, your presumption is correct. Uh, this does not expand uh, any bureaucratic program, but it does recognize that we uh, have a temporary status right now regarding the data on individuals collected by, by this type of education support services program. Uh, it's, its status of making this information private expires in August of this year. We're simply addressing that problem and making it permanently private uh, on the information on the individuals, not on the programs, but on the individuals that would participate. And, and Senator so Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Limmer, or to the testifiers, is there any scenario or anything that this information being private um, uh, I'm picking, trying to pick my word, co co covers up is not the right word, but is, is, does it limit the ability to evaluate this uh, program if 
if all the people that participate in it, in it and their information becomes private and you don't really know. And, and, and where I'm going with this is we've, we've had some unfortunate reports uh, here and there of some programs, uh, CCAP maybe being one of the more recent uh, bad stories that have come out. There's another one that's uh, been talked about recently and I'm forgetting uh, the topic that one was, but it, is, is there any scenario where we make this data private and all of a sudden it's easier to have um, less scrutiny over it and, and facilitate phantom numbers or uh, people that supposedly exist but they don't, like we saw in the CCAP. And I'm not assuming that by asking the question. I'm just doing the due diligence of the committee so we don't um, see bad stories like that and, and hear it was something we did in the process to allow that to not have the sunshine or the scrutiny. Uh, and, and maybe to wrap that up, what what would it be that what would be the negative for the people participating in this to not want to, the information shared, uh, which which this bill would would continue to make private? Senator Limmer, Mr. Chairman, um, I think it would be better for me to pass that question on to the practitioners that are involved in this program. Uh, perhaps they could give a, a better insight as to if there was some sense of question or um, a concern, uh, can, can wrongdoing be uh, recognized? Uh, I believe that this only, only makes private the role of individuals in the program, but not of the program itself. That program is still open to the public scrutiny. But I'll, I'll let the, one of the practitioners explain that. Uh, Ms. Lottie Johnson or Ms. Mims, either of you have some insight you'd like to share? I can start with it, um, Mr. Chair. All right, Members Ms. Lottie committee. Johnson. Thank you. Um, so this really, again, only makes private the data on the individuals. However, it does not preclude the ability for Hennepin County or others to be able to um, go in and create reports and do evaluations of the data. The people that are have access to the data can do that. Um, we do have Tennyson uh, notices that we provide and we can indicate in the Tennyson notice that um, access to the data is available for evaluation of the program. Uh, and, and we believe that it's really important to evaluate the program and make sure that we're using our funding um, to the best of our ability to make sure that we're serving individuals um, and that and that it's working for them. Um, and if if this data were not made private, the problem could be that I could actually like if I knew my neighbor was maybe involved in the program, I could reach out and say, "Hey, can you tell me, um, you know, how old is is?" Sue Smith and what's her date of birth and what are her grades in school and where is she struggling and all of that information. And that's not information that we want available to the public. In fact, most of our um, most of our, our participants would probably refuse to participate if they knew that um, you know their neighbor down the street could get the information if all they wanted to do was make a phone call. So this is this is not preventing access to the data to evaluate the program. Um, and improve services to the program, but it is accessing, um, accessing, uh, limiting access to the data so that people um, who who are it's just the general public should not have access to the individual data, not the summary data or the evaluation data. That would still be considered public data. Senator Westrom, is that a lead? Very good, Mr. Concerns? Mr. Chair. I think that helps answer my question. Thank you, Senator Limmer, uh, and uh, thank you for that answer. All right, thank you, Senator Westrom. Uh, Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I believe my question would be directed to uh, Ms. Lottie Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to ask if there is a, a retention schedule that is involved in this for this personal data and uh, whether that changes at all with this, um, this initiative going into place. Is this something that is kept for it? the individual's information and participation, is that kept forever? Or is there a, uh, a point where their uh, data will be uh, uh, deleted? 
Ms. Lottie Johnson. Mr. Chair, um, thank you very much for asking that question. We are actually, uh, we have submitted a um, updated retention schedule with this particular line item on it to the uh, Minnesota Disposition Panel requesting approval to um, maintain the data for, I believe it's six years is what our retention is, and then it will be um, destroyed based on the retention schedule. So we have anticipated that, and we do have plans to um, destroy the individual data um, at the time of retention. Any follow-up, Senator Mr. Carlson? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Any other members with questions or comments or discussions to the bill? Not seeing any here. Uh, don't see any more hands online. Uh, Senator Limmer, any final comments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it's <clears throat> vitally important to fill these gaps where temporary statuses of data privacy classification have been made. It follows in the tradition of Minnesota being a privacy protected state regarding individual records. We want our citizens to have the confidence that we are protecting their most intimate details <clears throat> in their life, and yet at the same time, we want to make sure that government records, government, uh, the idea of the ability to follow what government is doing is wide open to the public. So this uh, follows in that same tradition, and I think it's worthy of making this data privacy <coughs> permanent for, these, for this purpose. So Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move Senate file number 2429, be recommended pass and move to the Senate floor. All right, thank you. Senator Limmer moves that Senate file 2429 be recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. Uh, members online would unmute and turn cameras on. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say no. Motion prevails. The bill is uh, passed. Thank you, Senator Limmer. All right, next up is Senate File 2909, a uh, parent's rights protection in the education of their children, Senator Eichhorn. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's an honor to be here with you today. I always love coming to G15. This is one of my favorite committee rooms in the entire Capitol complex, so happy you're in here. So today I've got Senate File 2909, and I'd like to thank my co-sponsors, uh, Senator Chamberlain, Duckworth, Coleman, and Newman. Uh, we believe that children deserve the best when it comes to education, and a parent is a child's first and most important teacher and advocate. We need to empower parents with resources to help guide their children's education. And we believe that a parent's right to direct their education of their child does not end at the schoolhouse gate. Senate file 2909, the purpose of it would be to amend, clarify, and specify and send a message to parents, school districts, and the courts that parents serve as the primary role when it comes to the upbringing, education, and care of their children and youth. In addition to recognizing this fundamental right, uh, it established that it states that schools should notify parents of information relating to health, well-being of the parent's minor child, and prohibits the withholding of information about the child relating to health, well-being, and education. And also keeping with legal precedents in Subdivision 2, it states that government intervention contrary to parents is legitimate only when a compelling state interest at when there is a compelling state interest at stake and only if the potential infringements of parental rights is narrowly tailored and uses the least restrictive means. This reflects the strict scrutiny standards that uh, the courts have used to review the constitutionality of, of laws and other government actions that impact fundamental rights in the past. We know that children learn best when parents are involved in their child's education and to be involved, parents must be kept in the loop. We believe that transparency and accountability are two fundamental pillars of good government, and we think this bill does something to let parents know 
that they have these rights. Uh, it's something that parents throughout my district, and I've heard from member members, other members as well, that they've had parents in their districts talk to them as well that this is important to them. So that's why we've brought this legislation forward and appreciate the opportunity you've given us today to talk with your committee about it. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn. I would like uh, to call on Ms. Primo, Senate Counsel, for just a minute uh, to explain to the committee uh, this bill's already had a hearing in the Education Committee discussing uh, the policy merits of it. And uh, Ms. Primo, would you describe the jurisdiction, why it's here in the Civil Law Committee, and, the, and uh, help us with our focus uh, on the bill here? Mr. Chair and members, the primary substantive reason the bill is in our committee is um, at subdivision two, lines 1.16 to 1.22. Um, although subdivision one also defines parent, which is a term used in subdivision two, um, but subdivision two is the main focus. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Primo. Um, so I will Go to our testifier that is on our agenda, uh, Kelly Jansen from the Child Protection League. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then feel free to begin. Thank you. My name is Kelly Jansen. I'm with the Child Protection League Action. I'm here to testify in favor of Senate File 2909. The family is the foundation of any free nation. Parents love, provide for, and protect their children. They teach them their values, beliefs, and protect them from outside influences, harms, institutions, and people who do not have their best interests in mind. Parents protect their children from adults who prey upon the innocence and vulnerabilities of children too. No other institution but the family consistently provides that protection, none. No school, agency, or group of unrelated adults provide the same love and protection for children like a family does, despite the many times parents fail or fall short. It is the right and responsibility of parents to provide this structure. The reason it is necessary to reestablish parental rights in Minnesota statute is because of the current statute 13.02 subdivision eight. An individual acting as a parent or guardian in the absence of a parent or guardian, except that the responsible authority shall withhold data from parents or guardians or individuals acting as parents or guardians in the absence of parents or guardians upon the request by the minor if the responsible authority determines that withholding the data would be in the best interest of the minor. To paraphrase, this means someone who has little familiarity with the child, their circumstances, or their parents can decide the minor child can withhold personal data from their parents if the minor child asks the stranger to do so. To presume this authority can decide what is in the best interest of the child without consulting with their parents is an outrageous and dangerous practice. It usurps parental rights. Everybody knows there are peaks and valleys in a child's life, and they are not mature enough to make life-altering decisions without receiving love, consult, and guidance from their parents. Schools are institutions. They are trying to manage hundreds, if not thousands, of kids. They make lousy parents. They certainly do not qualify to be a trusted and final authority to step in and decide a child can sever their relationship with their parents by deciding they can withhold personal health information from them. Some of the decisions a child can make from that point on could be permanent and irreversible. 10 years later, where is that institution? Where is that responsible authority as the child struggles with regret or anxiety about a decision they made in the heat of the moment? They are not there. They are not walking alongside this person. The parents are. They have always been the ones who have loved and cared for that child, no matter what. I volunteered for several years as a first responder in a nurse's office at camp. If a child came into the office and needed anything more than a minor wound cleaned or bandaged, I would be on the phone as soon as possible to alert the parents so that they knew what was going on with their child. And not only was this my role, it's what I would want if the roles were reversed, where I was at home and they were making a medical decision concerning my child. Parents give consent for their minor children to take cough drops, Tylenol, and other medications while at school and camp. Why would we cut the parents 
out of major health-related decisions. It defies logic. The Child Protection League's mission is to protect children from exploitation, indoctrination, and violence. Senate File 2909 reasserts in statute that greatest principle for protecting children, a principle our nation has understood and practiced for generations, that it is a fundamental right of a parent to direct the upbringing, health, well-being, mental health, and education of parents' minor child. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Jansen. Um, so I will turn to testify or uh, questions from the committee to the author of the testifiers. I will start with Senator Bigham. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I think the uh, statement about teachers making lousy parents was inappropriate. I think there are members whose parents were teachers, and I don't think they would call their own parents lousy. So I think that was in, uh, very inappropriate. Um, my, my question is, what are, what are we trying to solve here when we have a teacher shortage, a shortage on paraprofessionals, a shortage on bus drivers that are trying to provide these very services that apparently are been being grossly intervened on. Um, and yet we're, we're focus, focusing on political propaganda like this. Um, I think we have other things to focus on uh, addressing, again, our teacher shortage, our frontline worker shortage, um, retention and recruitment issues, safe communities, and how we're going to deal with our economy and many other issues. Uh, my parents were my first advocates, and at 42 years old, they still <laughs> are a huge advocate. So I'm I'm not sure what, um, again, the the other than making some political political points, what the point is of this bill. Um, but um, I, I think you ought to let teachers teach, parents parent, and um, they're going to collaborate and work together. Um, because as we all know, we can't do this alone. It takes a lot of people um, to uh, help a child grow, teachers, coaches, uh, pastors, uh, and other civic organizations and, and important people in children's life. So um, I'm not really following why we're doing this right now when we have bigger issues to deal with related to education, and this isn't even an education committee. And again, um, I, I think we ought to refrain from having political propaganda bills coming up uh, in committee. Uh, Senator Bigham, I think uh, taking offense at some of the verbiage used on your end could equally be applied to the verbiage you're using to describe the bill as well. And uh, I encourage members to debate on the merits of the bill, express your agreements, your disagreements, and uh, let's let's keep some. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, I didn't I didn't call this a lousy bill or the author lousy, <laughs> unlike the testifier. So I I would take offense to you saying that what I said was offense. Uh, Senator Icorn. I'm not really sure, Mr. Chair, if there was a question in there. It sounded like quite a bit of statements. Uh, that were made in some very unfortunate. I can tell you that um, reinforcing parental rights um, so that parents can be informed advocates for their child's education is definitely necessary in light of several public comments that we've seen from Democrats throughout the country. Uh, I can certainly get into those if you want, but I think many of us, I know it's one of the things I hear about in my district, there's so many uh, accounts from constituents where parents are saying, we've been shut out of knowledge about whether it's curriculum or what's happening in the day from schools. Certainly some schools are doing a great job. This doesn't put an additional burden on teachers. Uh, this just says that parents have the fundamental right to be involved. And I don't see how anybody should have a problem with that. This is not some political propaganda piece as mentioned by Senator Bingham. Um, and it's, it's rather offensive that that's how she feels uh, parents throughout the state that are deeply concerned about their children's education 
It's, 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 it's concerning to hear that kind of language from another member, and it's unfortunate. But this comes out of a place of concern from average, everyday Minnesotans that have children in the public school system and want the best for every child. Senator Bigham, any follow-up? Okay, uh, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, if I could just ask the testifier, because I heard, I didn't hear what Senator Bigham requoted, and so either she misheard or I misheard. Uh, I heard uh, this phrase, schools make lousy parents. I didn't hear teachers, but maybe the testifier can just repeat that for us, because one of the two of us heard something that wasn't said. Ms. Jansen. Thank you for the question. Schools are institutions. They are trying to manage hundreds, if not thousands, of kids. So we're referring to the schools as institutions that make lousy parents. M Mr. Chair, I'll take my ears over Senator Brigham's ears any day, because mm -hmm. Senator Brigham, I think you should uh, uh, listen closer next time. I didn't hear the word teachers, and I'm glad she confirmed that. Well, and members, let's make sure that we uh, maintain Senate decorum uh, in this debate as well. Uh, that will be helpful so that we can discuss the, uh, the merits of this bill. Uh, Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, thank you for that last comment. It seems this is now uh, two days in a row when Senator Westrom has been reminded by the presiding officer of the body he's making comments in that he needs to be careful. He doesn't cross appropriate lines. So thank you for reaffirming that. I hope that Senator Westrom will take that comment to heart. Uh, secondly, I got a few questions about this, but I want to preface that there seems to be an awful lot of offense being taken in this conversation today. And as Robert Frost wrote in Mending Walls, good fences make good neighbors. So maybe we can uh, uh, talk to each other in a manner that reflects that. Uh, I'm trying to figure out really what's the target of this bill. And the uh, testifier was awfully oblique in describing what the concern is. She cited a statute in 1302 subdivision eight, but doesn't really tell us how that statute is in, in the views of her or her organization has been misused. So I'd ask the testifier if she could give me, I don't know, four or five very specific examples of data that was requested and not made available um, to parents so that I can kind of put this whole effort here into some concrete context. Ms. Jansen. Thank you. Um, well, one very egregious example that we have is from a family in Hibbing who um, the, the parents didn't know that the family, that the son was transitioning into a girl because the school had helped him and would not allow the parents the information that um, the son was utilizing to transition. He was given hormones, life-altering hormones, uh, behind his parents' back. It was a very disturbing case of uh, usurping parental rights. Senator Latz. Well, I appreciate that one example, Mr. Chairman, but maybe a follow-up question. Was the school actually medically involved in, in uh, providing those, medica those hormones or those medications? Was, was the school specifically providing counseling and guidance to the student to encourage them to do so? Um, I mean, this all belies the one question, how the heck wouldn't parents be able to see that? But um, what was the school's actual involvement uh, in, in the, this child's transition? Ms. Jansen. Do you want me to? You want... Senator I, so, Icorn. Senator, Mr. Chair, I don't know the specifics um, that the testifier is talking about. I'm not aware of that specific case, but the bill has nothing to do with any specific issue, but a general blanket statement that parents have these rights. And that's what parents are asking for. I know we're in your committee today because of subdivision two. Um, and I think we're getting a little far field from why we're here today in this committee. It's, it's, it's a simple blanket statement. There are other pieces 
uh, to what has been called the Minnesota Parents Bill of Rights that are broken up in uh, to other Senate files, and I can certainly provide you those other Senate files if your committee would like. I have those handy. Um, but I think we're getting a little far field from what this bill actually does, and it's pretty narrowly tailored. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Senator Latz. I think we have an obligation as legislators to understand what is motivating a particular bill. We don't need a, a legislative statement that simply says parents are important. Um, and this is not a narrowly tailored bill. This is an extraordinarily broad bill, which is very vague, doesn't give us any specifics as to what kind of information is, is being sought. And I think we have an obligation to find out what is the problem here that is sought to be fixed by the legislation that comes before us. And not only did I get almost no detail in response from the testifier, but now the chief author of the bill told me basically it's none of my business, don't worry about it. Mr. Chair, that is not what I said. Well, that's essentially, he said, we don't have the jurisdiction to talk about this, and it doesn't matter what the answer to my question is anyway, because this is just a broad bill that- Mr. Chair, that's it. also not what I said. Right. Well, that's the way I interpreted it, Mr. Chair. And I'm entitled to interpret the language as I believe it is said. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Senator Westrom, what's uh, the point of order? I'm referring back to your earlier comment that uh, Senator Latz uh, seem to take to heart, but his last comments seem to uh, violate his own uh, prior comments. So uh, I would just uh, ask the chair to uh, remind uh, Senator Latz uh, about questioning motives and what somebody said that wasn't said, perhaps. Yeah, Mr. Senator Latz, I'm gonna try to call balls and strikes equally and fairly amongst here and uh, uh, give the same encouragement to all. So uh, Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman, first of all, that wasn't a point of order properly. It was another member interrupting my conversation. Secondly, there was intent was not brought in here whatsoever in terms of the individual uh, member who's the chief author of the bill, but I have an obligation and a right to inquire as to the intent of the legislation. We all have that duty. And that's what I'm trying to determine. Subdivision one makes legislative findings that it's a fundamental right. And I wanna know why the legislature is being asked to make such a declaration. I'd also like to know, maybe council can help if the chief author, or maybe council can help, what is the legal implication of the legislature declaring that something is a fundamental right? So maybe I'll ask that question right now. If uh, Ms. Primo could answer that for me. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, um, I'll, I'll preface this with, with saying that generally legis a legislative finding section um, is only used in really unique situations. And um, that, however, the term fundamental right has a lot of um, constitutional protection around it. Um, under current case law, um, parents do have a fundamental right, um, and that has been developed by the Supreme Court of the, of the U.S. as well as uh, Minnesota law. And I believe that that is the type of fundamental right that section subdivision one is is attempting to address and then subdivision two is then seeking to um, codify the standard of review that's generally applied to fundamental rights um, that are found in um, the substantive due process clause of the 14th amendment um, and, and that's sort of how it works. Um, yes, this is Senator Latz and Mr. Chair, does that answer your question? Senator Latz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Primo, does the legislature have the authority as a constitutional branch 
to declare that something is a fundamental right under the Constitution? Or is that the is that solely the role of the courts? Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, generally it is the role of the courts to interpret and enforce the various rights and liberties that are found within um, uh, state and federal constitutions. Senator Latz, I, uh, I can think of other examples where a court has declared uh, a fundamental right and then efforts have been made subsequent to that to codify that into state or federal statutes. And I, one could make an argument that's similar to what uh, we're trying to do here in that uh, first subdivision of the bill. Uh, Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, thank you for that. I'm not sure which is the chicken and which is the egg here. Um, you know, I, if if this fundamental right already exists, then you know is this a codification or a clarification of that, or you know is this the legislature attempting to superimpose its own definition of fundamental rights onto an independent judicial branch under our constitution? Uh, I heard Ms. Primo indicate that the courts interpret fundamental rights that exist in the constitutions. But I did not hear her say that the legislature has the authority to declare something to be a fundamental right in and of itself. Um, but that kind of leads me to a second question and Ms. Primo addressed this in her initial remark uh, that I was going to raise anyway, which is that um, this is a legislative findings section. Um, and uh, uh, it's almost, well, it's extraordinary for the legislature to have bills that have a legislative findings. Oh, oh, let me rephrase that. It's extraordinary for the legislature to pass bills that have legislative findings provisions in there. Historically, what was then a combined judiciary um, uh, and, and civil law a committee would strip out the legislative findings provisions from bills that came through the committee because the legislative findings were essentially political statements. Um, and uh, this has been on a bipartisan basis. When I was chair of the committee, when Senator Limmer was chair of the committee, we both looked askance on legislative findings provisions. There are a couple of very large and complex fundamental provisions in state statute that do have legislative findings provisions. One is the Minnesota Human Rights Act. Uh, and that was in part because it was, well, it, the, another is a workers' compensation statute, as I recall. Um, but those were fundamental shifts in, in the whole statutory scheme as it related to, uh, to those topics. And legislative findings there, my understanding was for the intent of giving the courts uh, some guidance on on how they ought to contemplate interpreting the statutory sections that followed them. Um, and I, I just don't see the legislative findings provisions here as being of any particular value from that standpoint. And um, similarly, they, um, uh, they don't have any formal legal or statutory binding impact anyway. They're essentially political statements. And we make a lot of political statements in support of bills, but we don't usually pass them into statute. Um, so I'm wondering why uh, we have a legislative findings provision here and whether it's appropriate for even it to remain in the bill. Um, I guess I'd also like to circle back to the example that the testifier uh, gave, which that apparently the parents didn't know their son was transitioning into a girl and the school wouldn't tell them. Um, it, it, does the testifier have any knowledge as to whether or not the school was involved in that transition other than being aware of the fact that the student was taking medications? 
Ms. Jansen. Yes, um, the school helped the, the boy um, get to the county to get to medical services and helped him get an apartment for him to live on his own. They helped him um, in a number of ways behind the parents' back. And also, unfortunately, when referring back to the fundamental rights, this parent actually took um, a case and sued the county and the school and lost. So her parental rights were violated, even though um, it's in state statute. And, and Senator Latz. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, and to the testifier, how old was the student? He was 15 at the time. Ms. Jensen. Sorry. He was 15 at the time. Senator Latz. So, Mr. Chairman, I have got to believe that there was some reason why this student did not want the parents to know what was going on. And one reason I draw that conclusion is because the student apparently sought to live away from the parental home. Um, and so uh, apparently did not feel supported, cared for, maybe even loved at home. And while we would like to think that every household is the idyllic environment for every child, I mean, that's simply not the case. Um, and particularly, uh, my understanding is that in this case, the child was an emancipated 15 year old, which meant that the child had um, their own rights to make these decisions and had a right to not have the parents be aware um, of that. That, that. That's what emancipation means. Um, so I, the bill assumes that all parents are loving, caring, and supportive, that all parents are not abusive emotionally or physically toward their children, that all parents, uh, you know, are protective and that all parents know everything about what's best for their own children. Uh, but I don't think I could say that with an absolute uh, sense um, at this point. So, I mean, just all we got to do is look at family court and child protective services courtrooms and the counties that administer that stuff to know that not every family is the idyllic loving cocoon that we would like to think they are or should be. Um, and uh, so it, are there any other examples or is that the example that's motivating this bill? I mean, it sounds like there are people across the state that are clamoring for this legislation. And I'm, there must be at least another couple of examples of, of situations where, or is it this, that one court case that has you know, generated this bill, which would not be unusual. I mean, there are plenty of times where one court case has caught the attention of uh, advocates or stakeholders or involved parties, and they think there might be a legislative remedy to follow up on, but it'd be helpful for me to know. Ms. Jansen. Yeah, there are some other cases where parents have been left out of the loop. In the St. Paul School District, they give birth control and condoms to students without parental knowledge. In the Osseo School District, they do not proactively inform a parent if their child was in the nurse's office. Just recently, a student was punched in the stomach, which is actually a behavioral issue that the parent should have been made aware of because bullying can lead to mental health issues. Um, so, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think there's a whole body of law around the issues of, of uh, ac access to, uh, um, to contraception. Yeah, but I, I don't know that law specifically. Uh, but the question of whether or not a school proactively tells parents about a student's visit to the nurse's office, as opposed to the school denying a parent's uh, you know, inquiry about it, I think are two separate questions. And, um, especially if the student does not want the parents to know about it, because that is something that is as we as we're in chapter 1302 subdivision eight, the denial of sharing of data has to be at the request of the minor. Um, 
I, I do have a, another question, if I may, Mr. Chairman, and that is uh, clearly the schools are targeted here in this legislation because they're called out specifically, but the language is written very broadly. There's the state, any of its political subdivisions, any other governmental entity, um, or any other institution. So it seems to me that language written that broadly could theoretically apply to the courts as well, um, which would raise serious separation of powers questions. Uh, is, the, is it the intent of this legislation to cover the courts and court-related uh, data? Senator Eichhorn. Mr. Chair, the intent of the legislation uh, revolves around the school system, not the courts. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, then it seems to me if that's the intent, then the language should be more narrowly tailored uh, to apply to the school system specifically. Uh, those are all of the uh, examples that were given by the testifier as well. So it seemed to me that at least ought to be um, more narrowly written to accomplish that goal. And there's also something that was mentioned about curriculum information. Um, and uh, I guess I'm not familiar with any case in which a school has refused to provide parents with information about the curriculum that's being taught, but could maybe the chief author or the testifier give us a little more information on that here? Uh, Senator Icorn. I can tell you that um, there's a lot of anecdotal accounts, again, throughout the state, but even from my own district, um, and it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes uh, parents have had success and sometimes they haven't, and that's why we feel it's important to make it clear that parents do have that right so that in every case, when a parent asks for that access, they are able to receive it. Senator Latz. Um. I don't know if Ms. Primo can answer this question. Maybe we need counsel from the Education Committee, but is, aren't there already statutes that address access to uh, school district curriculum? Uh, Ms. Primo, is that something that you have uh, the ability to answer? Mr. Chair and members, um, I am not um, able to answer that. Um, so the question is, whether school curriculum is already available to um, parents upon request. Um, it's, it's possible that that would be publicly available data. I can't think of a statute, at least from a government data practices lens, that would classify that as private information, non-public information. Um, but I can check with my colleague and um, provide that information. Senator Latz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would appreciate that. I mean, I would, I mean, all government data is presumed to be public unless it's classified in some other classification in the Data Practices Act. Uh, so I would also assume that curriculum data is public data. Um, you know, if there's, if there are anecdotal cases where a particular school district or a teacher or administrator has not been forthright in, in providing that information, well then, you know, there are remedies already provided for in law um, to cover that, including a lawsuit um, and uh, or even, frankly, probably a well-written letter from a lawyer uh, pointing out that his public data would be enough if, if it's um, if it is, in fact, uh, public data. Um, but I don't know that we need to, you know, go to declaring fundamental parental rights. Uh, to address uh, that kind of concern. Um, so I, I, I guess uh, I, I just don't, I see a number of problems with this legislation. I don't see that there's an, uh, an overarching uh, remedy necessary to address this. Um, and I'm very concerned about uh, separation of powers elements um, of this legislation as well. I think this committee ought to take that into consideration uh, when deciding how to do this or what to do with this bill. Um, so uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Latz. Next up is Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm, uh, I guess I'm kind of confused on this as well. Uh, it seems to me that 
this is largely already handled in in law. And if there are some things that uh, uh, that perhaps a student divulges to a parent, uh, is the other parent of equal stature uh, supposed to be informed of that? And I. It, it's uh, it's very confusing to me because I have a, I have a constituent who has three children and they've had uh, let's say a not very friendly divorce and I I don't know uh, how the judge determined who was going to have custody but uh, one of the children is already uh, you know in their second or third career the other one has been a uh, a marine and is out of the service and another one is. Uh, just finishing high school, but all three have had major family problems with the two adults that are supposed to have the right to determine their future. Uh, they don't agree uh, from what county they live in, what school district they go to, what classes they take, and even uh, um, what kind of services that they should be qualifying for for the county. One parent thinks that it's an embarrassment to have county services. The other one thinks that this is this is a right of the child to have county services. I can't imagine, uh, other than using the uh, you know the what is it the King Solomon solution, uh, that how something like this can be resolved, and which parent, uh, whether it's a um, the uh, prime custody or shared custody. Which one uh, is the one that the state should be listening to, or that we demand that they listen to? Um, and uh, you know, and also, you know, I guess going back to that one that was the Hibbing incident. There, if uh, if someone is administering prescription drugs to uh, a, the child of another, I think that there is there ought to be some kind of uh, maybe legal decision that's in the background. And it sounds like the. Uh, that the child has been has gone through some part of the uh, uh, court system and has been emancipated. So I'm not sure where we're coming from with this and why we're targeting school districts. Because I now I've been married to a teacher for 52 years, and I've heard a lot of these stories, and I've heard a lot of stories that uh, the the student comes to the teacher and divulges things that the teacher has to keep to themselves, not even talk to other teachers, not, and certainly not talk to students or perhaps even one of the parents, especially if there's some kind of violence involved. And I'm, uh, I'm not sure that we don't have plenty of law to already handle that. We have plenty of services, legal services that should be handling that. And it's not something where we use uninvestigated, and I really want to stress that, uninvestigated anecdotes to change our statutes. So, Mr. Chair, I really, I would like to hear more if there is something that is really a, a better basis of making a decision on this bill, because right now I don't see one. Uh, thank you, Senator Carlson. Senator Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to uh, ask for a roll call. Roll call has been requested and a roll call granted. Uh, request that the results be recorded in the journal, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Latz requests that it be recorded in the journal. Are there three hands? Seeing three hands, I'm going to roll call. Chair Matthews? No, no. Wait, are we going to a vote right now? No, no. Um, oh. Scratch that, Senator Latz. We we're uh, working through a technical difficulty. And oh, thank you. Um, all right. Is there any more discussion on the bill before us? Uh, Mr. Senator Chairman? Latz. 
Uh, thank you. I did get some information online here uh, relating to that uh, Hibbing situation, and apparently the uh, uh, the mother sued her daughter, um, who had already moved out of the house and had obtained a, um, a, a legal uh, document that she was legally emancipated. Um, and uh, the uh, Eighth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the district court's ruling that the mother was not entitled to the medical records of her emancipated daughter. Um, and uh, what I can't tell for sure is uh, it, apparently they appealed it to the U.S. Supreme Court, and I would assume if there had been a different outcome, we would have been told about it. Uh, so just to put a bit of that into context, at, at some point, it's already readily acknowledged that individuals have a right, if they wish to do so, to leave the nest and to uh, eliminate the parental oversight on their very personal medical and even financial circumstances. Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Jansen. Um, just one thing about the emancipation that the student received. It was not received in court. The parent never got a day in court for the emancipation. It was just given to him uh, from a legal group. Well, apparently the... Uh, Senator Latz. Apparently the federal courts didn't seem to consider that a distinction if they considered it at all, it wasn't a distinction worth that made a difference in this case. Any further discussion? Uh, Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would just say this, that, um, you know, teachers, paras, nurse, school nurses are all under a lot of stress and um, shortages of um, you know, workforce and are an integral, vital, important part of a child's life. If there is one thing we agree upon, I would hope that we hold teachers to a high standard and their influence on children. Uh, I still talk to mine. I had the honor and privilege of actually serving in public office with two of mine, um, which is rare. Um, so they still in this day have a profound impact on it. I, I really feel that this is uh, a personal poke at, at teachers and um, I, I'll, everything that has been said here, um, parents uh, already can can do. I forgot my teddy bear at teddy bear day when I was in, in uh, elementary school and the teacher called to make sure my parents would bring it with. I mean, I, I just think this is a big uh, you know, government overreach of telling um, a very important aspect of what a child uh, spends their days in school. Um, you know, it, it takes more than just two parents to raise a child. There's educators, there's religious, there's civic leaders, there's coaches, I've said this, siblings, extended family. So um, I just feel like this is a, a really um, an onerous and almost punitive um, idea concept on on teachers, and and I just think it's un, it's unfortunate. Parents can can uh, have access to this, and are are uh, in when they choose to be involved in their child's life to get this. I also actually have the same concerns that Senator Carlson brought up about you know shared parenting issues um, that hasn't even been addressed, uh, and I I think that that's an important aspect that has been left out of this. And then of course, putting legislative intent um, uh, as has already been discussed at length. So um, those are my concerns of the bill, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Brigham. Any further discussion? All right, before I go to Senator Eichhorn for uh, closing comments, um, I will just comment on, I agree with this bill, uh, decided to bring it here and hear it in, here in this committee because I agree with comments Senator Bigham and others uh, made, I believe that, uh, that the schools and the teachers play a vital role 
uh, and with our kids. I do believe we agree on that. I believe that the vast number of teachers that work uh, alongside parents and uh, work in harmony together with the goals they're achieving, uh, I believe that's what happens a vast majority of the time. And I don't think that this bill uh, will necessarily impact or change anything they do uh, in that area or regard. But there's been a push that we've seen, not only in news stories nationally, obviously the, the largest example being Loudoun County last year. Um, and there are, uh, there are cases that keep coming up. I follow, um, I follow news organizations and reporters that have been following this and strife between parents and either a school board, a school education system, or an individual teacher that is not working in harmony with parents uh, continues to come up uh, more often than it should. And while we haven't had a Loudon type of story here in Minnesota yet, I would rather uh, address and reaffirm that parents have these rights uh, that should be both legally protected and uh, recognized so that we never get to a point uh, like we've seen there. Now I do have an area nearby in my area, it's not in my district now, but it, uh, it was just drawn into the same circle uh, with me last week where there was, it's, it's uh, not been in the news, but I know of families and parents that have had a real struggle and a real difficulty of then bringing concerns to a school board and not having it uh, heard or recognized. Um, and I, I don't have the freedom to uh, go into all of that, but now that it's a district um, that I'm a part of, uh, I'll be able to connect with them on a constituent level now, be able to talk that out and be able to try to work between the school and the parents to bring harmony uh, to the situation. I don't want to see the type of strife and conflict that we've been seeing in some cases that have gotten national attention to keep growing or keep moving forward. And uh, so for the vast number of teachers that work well with families, that work in harmony and pull in the same direction with the parents, I applaud them and I don't think that this is going to impact uh, the work that they do in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis whatsoever. I think the same comment as you made, uh, healthcare, you know, nurses and doctors also play an important role, and I agree, and I'd apply the same standard there. It, when, when doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals work in harmony with a family over the care of their uh, children, I think it is a much healthier, better outcome for everyone involved at the end of the day. And uh, when that doesn't happen, that's when it usually lands in the news or it lands as a constituent services issue in my office or it ends up in court or something along that route. And there is, uh, there is sometimes not even a good outcome no matter which way that resolves. So I appreciate Senator Eichhorn uh, bringing this bill forward. Um, Senator Eichhorn, do you have any closing comments? Thank you, uh, Mr. Senator. Mr. Chairman. Oh, Senator Latz. I, I want to respect the uh, right of the chief author to make closing comments, but I did have just one point to highlight. I want to respect the chairman's <laughs> right to do that as well, but I had some information that might be relevant to the comment that ju you just made, Mr. Chairman. Um, and that is to refer you to Chapter 120B.20 in state statute per parental curriculum review, which gives the parents a right to review the content of the instructional materials to be provided to their minor child. And if they object to the content to make reasonable arrangements with school personnel for alternative instruction provided by uh, themselves, not necessarily by the school. Um, so uh, Mr. Chairman, it might be a rather simple uh, solution for you to refer the, the, uh, uh, the dispute that you just referred to to that section of statute and. Maybe they can figure out how to comply with it. I appreciate thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Senator Latz. I appreciate uh, that. I've, I've got that here in my notes. And uh, anytime I can help, Mr. Definitely Chairman. Definitely utilize that. Um, Senator Carlson. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to actually commend you for the statement you made about uh, bringing this to the committee to have a discussion. All too often, we're not bringing things to the committees and having a good discussion like this. So this is this is very good on your part. I appreciate it. You know, we all don't always agree on everything, but we we can't go forward unless we are able to air our thoughts and air our opinions on these kinds of things. So that's uh, I I want to first of all tell you that that's I I really appreciate that. The other thing I want to do is I do want to say that uh, this is, you know, we do know that this has been a national issue, that this is something that has been traded back and forth across the nation. And in fact, I did look up Parents Bill of Rights. Anyone can do that. And uh, uh, Senator Josh Hawley uh, introduced the almost the same bill. It has a lot of the exact same words in it on November 21st to 20, I'm sorry, in November of 2021. And he calls it the Parents Bill of Rights. So it uh, it is something that is going across the nation and being introduced and, and discussed. So, uh, but thank you very much for bringing it up here so that we can talk about it in Minnesota. That I appreciate. Uh, thank you, Senator Carlson, and uh, I agree with your with your sentiments to that point. Absolutely, uh, Senator Icar. And any closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to present this bill today and have the discussion and, and listen to some of the concerns as well. Um, it appears that there had been great effort to try to make, make this bill out to be something that it's not. So I'll just reiterate again that the purpose of this legislation is just to amend, or not amend, it, the purpose of the legislation is to clarify and specify and send a message to parents and school districts that parents serve the primary role when it comes to upbringing and education and care of children and their youth. Children, we know children learn best when parents are involved in their child's education. Uh, and parents must be kept in the loop. And I like this statement again, a parent's right to direct the education of their children does not and should not end at the schoolhouse gate. We know that transparency and accountability are two fundamental pillars of good government. And I believe that this is something that, that makes a small step uh, to help that. Uh, with that, thank you again, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn. So the motion that will be before us is to move Senate file 2909 to be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. Senator Anderson, you Mr. Make Chair, motion? I'd like to move the roll call and have it moved to the floor. Uh, thank you, Senator Anderson. Um, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Chair Matthews? Yes. Rank, uh, Vice Chair Limmer? Yes. Ranking, mem ranking Member Bingham? No. Senator Anderson? Yes. Senator Johnson? Yes. Senator Westrom? Yes. Senator Carlson? No. And Senator Latz? No. There being five ayes and three nays, uh, the bill is passed and moved to general orders. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Eichhorn. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, having no more business before the committee, we now stand adjourned.